Um, we're really excited to be partnering today with, uh, with the Pavilion. Um, we have Marcus Schumate, who's the, uh, the program director over at the Pavilion. He'll be presenting on their behalf. Um, from the dorm side, we have Dr. Amanda Falk, my partner and our chief of clinical. Um, we have Sarah Hartz, our uh, director down on our DC campus, and we have Tracy Ashworth, who uh, welcomed you all today. She heads up our, our business development and outreach. Um, as far as some, some quick housekeeping points, there'll be roughly about a 35 to 40 minute PowerPoint presentation. We encourage everybody to uh, please use the chat box should any questions arise during the presentation, don't hesitate, um, followed by a Q&A. Uh, we will certainly try to get to all questions during the Q&A, but if we don't, uh, we'll be following up with a thank you note, um, a copy of the slides for everybody, and uh, personal information for each one of us to, to certainly encourage you to keep the conversation going. So with that, if I can ask Meredith to queue up the slides, and I'll turn it over to Amanda to get started. All right. Thanks, Meredith. Thanks, John. Thanks, Marcus. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Um, so this topic um, is a topic that um, is, is super important to, um, to me personally. Um, and I spent a lot of time studying aspects of this topic, um, especially as I was getting my PhD and writing my dissertation. Um, a lot of my research was about sort of um, looking at therapists and looking at countertransference and the things that impact our countertransference, which in turn impacts our ability to help the people that we, we want to help. During um, COVID-19, um, I think a lot of helping professionals have been under a high degree of, of stress and this has only been compounded now with um, the more recent um, events of, um, you know, racial violence. We're we're just seeing a lot of stress on mental health providers. Uh, I think that being a mental health provider is so rewarding and so gratifying, and we have the potential to make such a significant and positive impact on the lives of people who are in pain and who are who are suffering at their very core. Uh, unfortunately, I think that too often the mental health or the well-being of the helper, the person doing the helper, is, is often overlooked. Um, it's overlooked and it's unfortunate because it's really an important thing for us to be looking at. When I uh, was writing my dissertation, I wrote uh, about wounded healers. And for purposes of my dissertation, I was looking specifically at clinicians who worked in the substance abuse field. But I think uh, this concept of wounded healer really applies to, to any helping professional. I don't think I've met anybody in my lifetime who doesn't have some type of wound that they have experienced. Um, the wounds might be different, some might be uh, fresher, some might be raw, or some might be deeper, um, but we all have our own unique wounds. Uh, and as people who have our own unique wounds, on some level, we are sharing an identity relationship um, and sometimes even a diagnosis with the individual that we are treating. When we look at the population at large, one in five individuals struggle with a mental health diagnosis. And I think the rate is even higher um, among helping professionals. If you look specifically at substance use treatment, uh, some, some research shows that as many as 60 to 70% of helpers or practitioners are themselves in recovery from addiction. Some agencies um, will even uh, 
go out of their way to attempt to recruit or to hire people who have these wounds, who have this diagnosis. Um, if you look at certified recovery peer advocates or certain volunteers, or I've seen job postings that call out friends of Bill are encouraged to apply. So in our field, we have a lot of people who are wounded healers. As you wounded healers, I think that, um, you know, we face some unique challenges and that if we do not sort of consistently and vigilantly attend to our own health and wellness and functioning, then we are at risk for things like distress, burnout, or emotional exhaustion, depersonalization, low self-evaluation, compassion fatigue, vicarious traumatization, developing problems with just general professional competence um, and negative countertransference in therapeutic work. And then lastly, moral distress. For when we look at burnout and compassion fatigue, I just wanna sort of dive into these concepts a little bit further. Burnout. Um, some studies show that between 21 and 61, which is a, a broad range, 61% uh, of mental health practitioners report moderate to high levels of burnout. And symptoms include emotional exhaustion, depersonalization, or a lower sense of personal accomplishment. Uh, you know, I would guess just anecdotally based on my experiences of working in this field and, and talking to to peers that that number is probably closer to the 61 percent uh we work hard we hold space for a lot of pain and a lot of suffering and uh that can be exhausting that can be super exhausting compassion fatigue is emotional and physical exhaustion leading to a diminished ability to empathize or feel compassion for others so in essence, because we feel so much empathy, because we feel so much compassion, if we are unable to take care of ourselves so that we can hold the difficult feelings for our clients, so that we can um, be there emotionally for them, if, if we're unable to take care of ourselves, the empathy and compassion that we feel will negatively interfere with our ability to continue to feel empathy and compassion. Eventually, the brain sort of shuts down because it can't take anymore, it can't hold anymore, there's no more space for it. Vicarious traumatization. This is when empathy, attunement, and emotional availability can make a therapist vulnerable to feeling a client's pain in complex and profound ways. It is the transformation in the self of a trauma worker or any helping professional that results from empathic engagement with traumatized clients and their reports of, ex of traumatic experiences. So indirect exposure to traumatic events through a first-hand account or narrative of that event can lead to a trauma-like reaction in the helping professional. Countertransference. This is, this is sort of the heart of, of what really um, I find fascinating to sort of think about and explore. So countertransference is the effective behavioral or cognitive reactions of a therapist to their client. So just to flesh that out a little bit more, when I say effective behavioral or cognitive reactions, um, countertransference, an example of an effective reaction, countertransferential reaction would be that a client makes us feel a certain way. Maybe um, the client reminds us of our overly punitive mother and whenever we are with that client, we feel insecure and less than. That's an effective reaction. 
behavioral countertransference is when we actually do things um, countertransferentially in the working dyad. So maybe I have a very positive countertransference towards a client. And as a result, I always um, let my sessions go five minutes over with that client. That's, a, that's an action that I'm doing, that's behavioral. Or on the flip side, maybe I'm having more of a negative countertransference reaction to a client and I'm always sort of slow to return their emails or I kind of ignore their text messages or I'm always looking at my watch during sessions. That would be a behavioral reaction. And then the cognitive countertransference would be something along the lines of if I am having a negative reaction to a client, maybe um, I think about them and I diagnose them utilizing um, labels or language that is, you know, less than professional. Maybe I'm very quick to label them as borderline. Um, Maybe I jump to diagnostic conclusions. That's more impacting the way that I think about the client. So because wounded healers share this identity relationship with a client, there's certainly potential for really complex countertransference. And that's on the positive and the negative side. Um, and as a result, countertransference can positively or negatively impact the quality of the therapeutic relationship or the therapeutic alliance. So it's really um, important to recognize, um, identify, process, and understand countertransference so that it doesn't negatively impact the treatment process. We're gonna experience it. That we have to accept. That's what makes us human. We are human first and foremost. Um, and that's okay. We, we are going to have these reactions to the people that we work with. But, you know, the management of the countertransference is where it's, it's really our responsibility to be on top of that. And that requires supervision, a team approach, and it really requires self-care. Because if we are not taking care of ourselves, we are going to be more susceptible to not recognizing that countertransference or acting out on the countertransference. And then just on the flip side of it, um, transference, um, which, which many here um, have experienced and understand is the, the redirection to a substitute, usually a therapist of emotions that were originally felt in, in childhood by a client. Um, so, you know, while we may represent somebody who is revered and loved by our clients at other times, we may be the object of transferential hate. Um, and that can be really emotionally taxing and grueling. It's, it's not fun as a therapist to be, um, on the other side of transferential, um, hate for lack of a better word or you know to be yelled at by your client when you're really just trying to, to help them uh, moral distress so this occurs in situations where you you as a helping professional know what the right thing to do is but doing it is prevented due to either real or per or perceived constraints so um, let's say that we have a client that does not appear to fit into your treatment setting or to a specific um, level of care, but you feel conflicted about transferring the client and or discharging the client. Um, I think a lot of people in the mental health field, especially during um, COVID-19 and coronavirus where um, everybody, um, the whole world is experiencing a lot of uncertainty as it comes to things like job security, um, finances. I think there's, we need to call a spade a spade. Mental health professionals um, are, are, are scared. Are our clients going to come in? Are they just going to stay at home? Are they going to be seeking treatment? Are our jobs secure? And there can be that unconscious sort of um, uh, distress around, you know, doing what's right clinically, which of course we always want to do, but we have to recognize that we are human and that there are going to be other things going on in the back of our head. 
Uh, thanks, Meredith. So I guess what I wanted to talk about is um, now is what we are doing at the dorm to address self-care and the importance of self-care with our team. And when I say team, that is therapists, that is support staff, that is operations, that's HR, because we all really need to be taking care of ourselves um, right now uh, so that we can take care of our clients. There's um, an analogy that I always use, uh, especially with new therapists, which is when you get on an airplane and the oxygen masks dropped, the instruction is that you put that mask on your ch on yourself first, and then you put the mask on your child. As, as a parent, that seems so counterintuitive. You just wanna take care of your kid before you take care of yourself. But if you're not breathing, you're not gonna be able to help your child anyway. So you really need to take care of yourself so that you can take care of others. So some things that we've been doing is, um, and, and these are things that we've been doing ongoing, is that we have daily team meetings. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, every day of the week, we have a team meeting. Uh, one of these days of the week, on Wednesdays, in that team meeting, the only thing that we talk about is counter-transference. So we're talking about ourselves. We are not allowed to talk about our clients during that meeting. Um, unless it relates to how they are making us feel. So we get an hour of team meeting where it's just us focusing on ourselves and supporting each other and getting feedback and getting support and saying, you know what, that client also made me feel this way. And when I was feeling this way, this is what I did. We also have individual supervision uh, once a week. And then we really try to be mindful of of caseloads and, and numbers of people on caseloads. We really try to keep the number of people that any one therapist has to manage on their caseload in the six to eight range. And that's in an outpatient facility because doing more than that, it just, it's, it's too much. It's, it's too much emotionally. Um, and otherwise to manage and and it just takes away and it detracts from the care that we give our clients we've also been doing um, quarterly team building and these are just really fun um, uh, events that the staff participates in as a team like um, different scavenger hunts or ropes courses we were all set to do a really cool one um, at the end of March which of course got canceled because of coronavirus at Chelsea Piers, which is going to be like a little um, staff Olympics, which I was personally very excited for. But these are the things, you know, the, the more that we are connected and feel safe with each other, the more support that we get and the less susceptible that we will be to the burnout, the compassion fatigue, and then in turn, the inability to manage countertransference. Since uh, COVID-19, we have increased the amount of time off that we give staff so that and then allowed them to use those days moving forward um, without having to worry about not being able to roll days over because as we know people can't travel as freely right now so they might want to use them at a later time we have increased our medical leave we've also initiated a tap in tap out system where if somebody is feeling um, like they just need a time out and they need a break, they can tap somebody else in who can do um, some of their individual check-ins, some of the extra client stuff that we've added in during this time. They can recenter themselves and then tap back in when they're ready. We've been offering um, weekly just fun activities for, for staff, like one of our staff members recently got certified in Zumba. So once a week, she does a staff um, Zumba class for all of us. We've also um, done something called Foodie Fridays. When we were all virtual, um, every Friday, staff members would be able to put in an order and food got delivered to their house and we would eat lunch together as a team. And then the last thing is um, this dorm impact initiative. When 
COVID-19, when the crisis really sort of erupted, we wanted to figure out as an organization how we could not only take care of ourselves as staff and and our clients and, and our small community, but also how we could help society and outside of ourselves. Um, because there's a lot of pain and suffering going on right now. And if we could connect to a a greater cause, a greater good. And what we decided to do was that every, for every individual session, group session, health and wellness session, family session that a client attends, we donate $1 to the cause that we've chosen. And, And we've chosen different causes throughout this time, such as No Kids Hungry, um, NAMI, NYC, NAACP. So there's different organizations that we're donating to, but it, it feels good to know that the work that you're doing is serving a greater good, and that can certainly help with some of the, um, the burnout. And now I want to turn things over to Marcus in Pavilion to talk about. Cool. Thanks, Amanda. Uh, first off, thanks everybody for join, joining this. Um, if you're anything like me, you're probably Zoom exhausted and tired of being painfully aware of the weird faces you never knew you made. Um, so I appreciate you bearing through one more of those. But so. Uh, I guess first off, uh, I'm the director of the Young Men's Program here on campus, um, and that's that's the capacity that I'm serving in. So Pavilion as a whole, uh, what we've always had here, and this is sort of administrative down, management level down, um, they've always been wonderful about PTO. Um, I have a copious amount of PTO that I'll never actually use, but it's nice to see that it's there. Um, The uh, but the nice thing too is we have a cultural expectation of using it. So like you know, the idea of having PTO, but being panicked when you go and how are your clients going to be taken care of? What kind of uh, storm are you going to be walking away or back into? We've really done as much as we can as uh, as a culture, and especially in the young men's program, to create a staff culture where nothing gets left behind, no clients left behind. If I suddenly drop dead, my clients will be taken care of uh, and vice versa. So it allows us just to function sort of hive mind. It allows us to, to when we're off, to actually be off. Um, you know, I just came back from a vacation and in theory, I could have stayed off of my phone um, and not answered work calls or taken referral calls, but um, I do kind of like it. So I, so I did, but it's nice to have that pressure off where you don't feel like you have to. Um, and that's just part of the culture building we've done here and I've done within my own program. Yoga for staff, that's always sort of been around, not just yoga, but, you know, we do it during, we have yoga for staff during lunch. Uh, we have 170 acre campus. So there's like run groups that are happening with trail runs before and after lunch, people meet up. Um, and generally the sort of vibe is when, as long as things are getting done, then, then take your time. If you need to get, you know, if you've done all your work and you want to go sit outside and have a cup of coffee or something, go enjoy the, the property and, and do that. And um, The other piece is we have a chef, we're a residential facility, so um, we have the luxury of having a phenomenal chef and then get to have uh, killer meals that are provided for us. And it's not just the food's good, you know, like today I had a salmon on a bed of greens and it was delicious and wonderful and all that sort of stuff, but it's also, you know, gathering around the meal table with all the clinical staff and committing copious amounts of HR violations before we go back into the fray. Um, it's nice and it's a good way to, to culture build and relax. So uh, with COVID that's shifted, we used to have this thing where, you know, we try to cram 20 people around one table and just work on beating all the inside jokes to death over and over and over again. But since COVID, we've had to spread things out, but we still maintain some of that. Then it, the other big piece of this that's been going, I, I've been at Pavilion for eight years now, and something that we've really done and especially hammered in the last five years is supervision. So there's a really, really robust supervision structure here. So 
I've been in a working supervision group for five years with roughly the same people. We know each other's dynamics. We know when each other are frazzled or fried and uh, what's going on and how to support. We know how to joke with each other to uh, bring each other to tears and laugh and, and, and really generally care for each other. And that's been this wonderful growth opportunity. In fact, it sort of reached its culmination point where we sort of felt like we could kind of shift out of it. And most of us decided that we wouldn't do that because we just liked it. Uh, it was re rejuvenating. Um, but I'm in two supervision groups a week uh, in individual supervision as well. And I'm getting supervision for the supervision that I do for my staff. Right. So there's a cultural and professional development piece that's happening. COVID has shifted a lot of stuff and we've had to go into, you know, Zoom meetings on campus and all that sort of stuff. All of our clinical staff are still on campus and still working and still seeing patients, but we're, we're taking a lot of COVID precautions. So it's shifted how, how we've had to do things. But we've added staff support groups that are just amongst staff and it's just open space to sort of air. Uh, morning coffee meetings, I put that there because uh, just organically what would happen after every morning staffing is, you know, myself and my staff in the young men's program end up sitting against the wall in the cafe drinking entirely too much coffee until we can barely think straight and laughing and having a good time and then it just sort of rejuven you know gets us spurred up for the day um because of covid we had to shift for social distancing to make sure that we had uh, room for our clients so that they had you know they could eat and, and not you know not have us around them so had to find a new location but having that as a morning ritual has always been this thing that sort of actually sort of excites me and, and the rest of us about coming to work because we know that we're going to have a, at least 30 minutes to joke around and, and just genuinely enjoy each other. As an organization, staff that could work remotely, we've made it uh, available to them to be able to work remotely and given them pretty flex, a lot of flexibility coming on and off campus um, as it makes sense. For the Young Men's Program, uh, <laughs> we instituted Rule 62. So some of you in cover, recovery may know that rule, but um, broadly speaking, it's don't take yourself too seriously. Um, so one of the things that that played out in the Young Men's Program is Hawaiian Shirt Wednesday. Uh, I don't know why we settled on Hawaiian shirts, but it, uh, it seemed perfectly tongue in cheek and irreverent for us, so we did. And uh, part of that follows into the next point. We started, uh, we try to keep a really, really open campus. We want to have relationships with our uh, clients and, and so that they actually want to come back because we actually, for the most part, like them. Not all of them, but you can't, can't bat 100%. So. But we always want them to come back. We want them to feel welcome and we want campus to be open. Because of COVID, though, we haven't been able to do that. And to be honest, I mean, all of us know working in this population and, and working – in this field it can be exhausting so we just get worn out and, and it's wonderful to see people that are like people that we've worked with flourishing and to not have that regularly showing up on campus to be honest was one of those hidden morale blasters that we just did not anticipate so the young men's uh program staff created weekly alumni zoom meetings and we do them every wednesday which uh we it's kind of become like a little game within that to see who's got the most outrageous Hawaiian shirt for that meeting. Um, but things like that have given us some sort of normalcy and connection to our, our alumni. And then one thing I'll add to this, because I've, I've kind of forgot to add it. We actually started, a, uh, we've got book, a book club on campus uh, that's for some of us nerds and also started a podcast group uh, also for some of our nerds. Uh, interestingly, all the podcasts typically involve murder and mayhem and the macabre. So we get together as a staff you, once a month after having listened to some sort of podcast thing. And, and it's just, it's been a really nice way to, to all stay connected. Even the people that are off campus, they can kind of zoom in. So it's just been a nice way to hold cohesion. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. So none of this, I don't think anything about this is, particularly groundbreaking for us. I and mean, we all sort of know this and yet we all forget it, right? Like well-being is absolutely essential for us in, in the helping profession. Um, if we're showing up to work and we're fried and our heads aren't in the game and we're not able to be present or we're stirred or we're exhausted, then we're not able to be present for our, our clients, right? We're not able to 
be attuned. And the way someone, I heard someone put it this way, uh, especially working in this sort of setting or working in what we're doing, we're having, we leave, we leave our places of employment and we step out into the world of COVID. And then we come back, we're stepped back into the world of COVID and we're exhausted with, with all of that. And it wears us down. It, it, you know, so you, you never really get a reprieve from it. Um, so we've all had to be way more diligent about how it is that we sort of take care of ourselves. One of the things that we know with research is that really it, it's all about patient perception of the relationship with the therapist. And I, I think a lot of times we, we talk about that, and most of us know that, but we talk about it as if it's something sort of mystical. I, I actually think it's just probably simpler than that, right? Like we, we like spending time with people that are fun to spend time with. And it's not fun to spend time with someone that's not present, someone that's stressed, someone that's exhausted, someone that's lost in their head and completely not only distracted. So we want to spend time with people that are grounded and present. Um, and in doing that, and when we're taking care of ourselves, we're able to be attuned for our patients um, and present with them and actually just sort of be pleasant people that they want to keep showing up to sessions for. Um, I think another placeholder for emotional attunement is like not being lost in our own heads. Right? So if we're out in the world of COVID and we're stepping back into the world of COVID, it's super easy to get lost in that. Um, personal recovery is not this, it's, it's obviously not linear. Any of us that have been in the field know that it's, um, there's a, uh, Bill White in some of his literature, he coins this phrase and I love it, uh, serial recovery. And it's the idea that, very often someone gets better in stages and they, they give up different substances in stages, they give up different behaviors in stages and, and they shift and they move along. Um, for us as providers, that can be frightening and exhausting because we're, we're highly invested in who we're working with, right? So if we, um, we have to find ways to take care of ourselves so that we can stay grounded throughout that enti the entirety of that journey. Some of us are, uh, you know, we obviously do supervision. I'm always a fan of having an individual therapist, journaling, professional development. Um, I'm a huge, huge advocate for contemplative practices. I, I, I engage myself, meditative practices, mindfulness. Um, there's a world of apps and uh, resources out there that are just phenomenal. And I, I'd be happy to recommend any and all of them. Um, and podcasts, I'll talk ad nauseum about podcasts if someone makes that mistake of opening the door but um exercise the thing i'll say about exercise is that i think it's important to have exercise that's actually play that's fun um if you're not someone that just enjoys showing up to the gym uh chances are if you're doing it it's not super high um I, anybody that knows me knows that i'm i'll talk about podcast and jujitsu um for me i i you know, I'm on the mats four or five nights a week with teammates practicing um, and exercising with them. And so it's a form of exercise that I look forward to and has a lot of social components to it. So I think finding any sort of exercise that really keep, keeps you activated and engaged in it. Um, obviously, boundaries uh, are a huge piece. We can't be there for our patients the entire time, uh, nor should we be. Uh, we have to find ways to create sort of carve out boundaries for ourselves and, and um, so that we can have some sort of sanctity of mind. Um, use of self versus making a therapeutic intervention about self. This is a weird and slippery idea, uh, but I love the quotation around self. You know, modern, pre you know, modern neuroscience, contemplative practices, and, and even just sort of simple techniques can show us that self isn't this static, fixed, entity that sort of resides behind our face. It's this thing that's always fluid, always shifting, always changing. Um, but if we're not careful, we fall under this sort of paradigm of suffering where we latch on to this fixed idea of self. And then if you're not careful, you, you get into your ego, you get into this transference, counter-transference that Amanda was talking about. And it, if you, too much reliance on self, and the idea of what we are self, you, you sort of invite these unnecessary power struggles that are, that are just going to compound the exhaustion. So, um, conscious time. 
Therapists must make a rational and conscious effort to recognize that they must let go of thoughts, feelings, and other associations from sessions or work in order to have time for well-being. Um, that's where my, you know, in particular, my meditative practices come in, and I, I think there's a lot of wonderful resources for that. Um, it can be super difficult to not just get lost and, and take work home. And, you know, frankly, we're just, we're a finite resource. There's a psychoanalysis, I, I think it was Kohut who, who sort of highlighted this, but he's, he said that essentially the object of therapy is to be able to become playful. And what he meant by that is like all humans, we have this tendency to become ruminative and stuck in these thought patterns over and over and over again. And they become stagnant and, and somewhat fixed. And it's this constant sort of, sort of form of suffering that can just be exhausting. And I love his idea that therapy is about becoming playful so that we're not as fixed or stuck or so that we can laugh at our silliness and ruminations. Another way of maybe thinking about this is sort of finding conscious time to create flow states. So can you find activities that are so pleasant, natural, and enjoyable that you can just, that you can just flow right into them and, and sort of not have to think too much? We need playtime. Um, I know oftentimes in the field, we talk about doing personal renewal. Um, I think a lot of times we tend to think of that as like seeing your therapist. We see it as these, these big cathartic experiences, but very seldom do we, do we see it as um, just time to play and, and learn something new, engage in some sort of hobby that's completely unrelated, but pulls us out of those ruminative states so that we can be a little bit more flexible because that allows us to be present for our patients. Um, this one, uh, I will, uh, the, the example that I gave is just a personal example. Um, so I'll be fully transparent. I'm horrible at waking up at 2 a.m. Uh, and then having some weird thought about a patient or a client pop into my head. And then, you know, for 20 minutes, I'm sitting there thinking about it or then some sort of programmatic issue or something that I'm doing, worrying about census, worrying about relate, you know, professional relationships, worrying about whatever and then trying to problem solve it. Um, the thing, that, this may be crass, but the thing that I found that sort of helps me is, in, is I'm not being paid for that time, right? Like this is a vocation and, and it's a professional vocation that we've, we've sort of elected to engage in. And so there's, we have to carve out time. And, and for whatever reason, if I can sort of remind myself that this is my time. This isn't a uh, pavilion's time. It's not my client's time. This is my time to put on my own oxygen mask. So, you know, I'll tell myself to close my eyes, lunatic, go back to sleep or something. And, you know, and sometimes it works. Most of the time it doesn't, but you know, maybe it'll work for someone else. So um, this is, uh, this is some of the, these ideas are pulling a little bit from some of Sandra Bloom's work with how to create like uh, trauma informed care models and, and moral safety with staff. You know, all organizations have hierarchy. There's, I've never seen a way around it. It'll typically arise organically or it's going to arise structurally. And when that happens, there's always going to be power differentials as you move up the chain. There's going to be greater responsibilities, uh, different, different things that are done. And one of the things to keep in mind when you're trying to make these giant changes that we've had to make with COVID, one of the things that we ran into is staff that weren't exactly a part of the decision-making process somewhere down the line, they're left holding this baggage where it was talked about ad nauseum up at the top, and then it sort of gets disseminated down. And they, don't, they haven't been able to be privilege to the rationale, to the thinking, to the whole process, to witness it, to be a part of that conversation. And most of them may not have even wanted to be, but it's just, you know, the natural product of, of managing an organization. In organizational psych, there's a, you know, they've done a lot of research on this. There's a tipping point in organizations. The larger they get, they sort of switch from a small organization to a large organization. And that's, when that happens, you, you start to run into more of these problems. When you've got a small leadership team and a small clinical staff team, you, you don't, the hierarchy is much more horizontal, but the bigger you get, the more you run into these sort of issues. So one of the things that we've had to do is make sure to take time out of our day as managers and explain to our staff the rationale behind the decisions. Um, 
why are we not having campuses, you know, visitors on campus? Why, why are we um, not allowing uh, patients off campus when they, when they arrive and all this sort of stuff. And then just walking people through that so that they're not left in the unknown. Uh, Cause being left in the unknown can create a lot of discomfort. Um, and it can be really difficult to create that sort of isomorphic top down organizational alignment around, around these things. So, taking the extra time to just walk people through why decisions are being made. And here's the thing, right? It's not just related to COVID. That's just good, good practice, right? Keeping in mind that, you know, someone down the line is going to have to deal with the decisions made up the line and then doing the best to sort of bring them into authorship and uh, around that can be, it can be helpful. We all appreciate it. So um, yeah.